Boa noite a todos e todos. É um enorme prazer abrir esse ciclo de palestras da Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Meu nome é Eric Klug, eu sou presidente da Japan House São Paulo. A Japan House é uma iniciativa do governo japonês, estabelecida em 2017, que recebe milhões de pessoas para suas exposições. Temos duas no momento, a exposição Daisy Balloon e a exposição da artista japonesa Yuko Mori e uma infinidade de eventos online e híbridos, incluindo, por exemplo, as nossas exposições virtuais, todas acessíveis no nosso site, eventos como o nosso clube de leitura e as nossas online trip. Então fiquem, por favor, é, convidados a visitar presencialmente, digitalmente, a Japan House e usá-la como uma ponte entre o Brasil e o Japão. Nós investimos muito nos nossos recursos de acessibilidade, tanto física quanto digital, para tornar essa experiência o mais ampla possível e mais prazerosa. Muito obrigado. Good evening and welcome to another lecture organized by the Japan House São Paulo in collaboration with the School of International Relations at Fundação de Tudo Vargas. This round of events bring together researchers from Japan and from, the, from Brazil to discuss some of the most relevant issues on contemporary international affairs. Tonight we are welcoming back Professor Alexandre Uehara and Professor Narushigi Michishita to present their takes on the Japanese foreign policy in the 21st century. Once again, we highlight that all statements expressed during this event represent only personal opinions and not necessarily the institutional position of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Also, all present here have agreed to participate and have consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be later posted on FGV's official channels. The audience is encouraged to participate by sending questions during the event through the Slido platform, which can be accessed in the event description on YouTube. Tonight, the professors are swapping their places and the main lecture will be given by Dr. Alexandre Uehara, one of the main specialists in Japanese international affairs in Brazil. He is the academic coordinator of the Brazilian Center for International Business and Corporate Diplomacy and of the Center for Asian Studies and Business. He is a professor, professor at the Faculty of International Relations at ESPM. Professor Uehara collaborates with the postgraduate program of Japanese language, literature, and culture at the University of Sao Paulo, where he also coordinates the group of studies on Asia. He received his PhD from the University of Sao Paulo and has been visiting professor in Japanese institutions such as Keio and Sofia universities, as well as collaborating with Japan's external trade organization. Dr. Uehara, welcome back and thank you for joining us. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for our kind presentation, Luana and Professor Nikishita. Good evening, good morning in Japan. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> can I start? Oh. Yes? Yes, you can start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, again, I want to thank you, the Japan House São Paulo and the FGV for inviting me for this webinar and for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, important issue. I would like to highlight the importance of this event and the issue of Japan foreign policy, including the two weeks ago lecture of Professor Mikshita in our context of international relations transformations that we are playing. Uh, seen at this moment. And I can say that this is a beauty of the international relations era because we can learn history, but each day bring new facts to happen and create possibilities to uh, analyze. And what we do today is this thing. Everything happened things and in the international relations we have to, to pay attention for these new things that happen every day. Uh, I will share my presentation now. It's okay. It's up here. Okay. Okay. Today we will talk about the Japanese foreign policy and 
uh, as I said before, we can learn something about with our history also. And today I want to talk about the Japanese foreign policy phases. And for this presentation, uh, I will discuss this uh, transformation in Japanese foreign policy in the 20th century and 21st century. Today, uh, we discuss this orientation of Japanese foreign policy. And for this purpose, we cover some ideas of professor of the national relations from Tokyo University, Takashi Noguchi, and Paul Bacon from Waseda University. And they read this article in uh, 2006. And the article was named Japan's Emerging Role as Global Ordinary Powers. And I think it's interesting this uh, phases that they show in the article because they divide Japanese uh, history of foreign policy in 15 years. Uh, and why they divide this period in 15 years? Because they also uh, recover the argument presented by Henry Kissinger, an American politician and former US State Secretary. And the Kissinger, in the book named uh, American Need a Foreign Policy. And this argument, in his argument, he said that uh, the Japan has been taking some 15 years for to respond decisively a major politi political transformation. And using this uh, thesis, this idea, Inogut and Bacon proposed a study of Japanese foreign policy since 1945 and divided into uh, phases of 15 years as shown in the chart. And quickly, I will briefly uh, explain these phases. The first phase is from 1945 until 1960. And it, this was a period in which there was extensive discussion of whether Japan should or not work closely with the United States. This discussion happened because many Japanese saw this period as a humiliation time. And why, why was a humiliation time? First, because the Japan was occupied by the, uh, Japan has a period of occupation and for interference, especially from American uh, force. Second, because Jap Japanese population had to deny some Japanese culture, characters, and traditions. And for example, some Japanese politicians that were identified with the Japanese military in the Second War were prohibited to be part of the government after the Second War. There's a, a huge interference in the Japanese political life. And the third, uh, argument is, was uh, the Japanese felt humiliation time because under the Yoshida doctrine, Japan focused on the economic growth and delegated the national security to a foreign country, specifically to US or American force. These uh, facts made Japan or Japanese people to refuse this period or felt this period as a humiliation time. In the second phase from 1906 to 1975 was the period in uh, which the world saw the Japanese economy recover and the leaders of other countries and the results of Japanese economy and started to criticize the Japanese political low profile in international issues. 
And one example of this position was the General Charles de Gaulle, president of the France, that they called Japan or Jap Japanese foreign policy as, as a free rider because Japan could uh, focus on it, its economic growth and other issues uh, was left to American or other countries. In the third phase, from 1975 to 1990, we had the shift position from Japan. And Japan position shifted from the, the time was called the free rider to a systemic supporter, and specifically to United States. It is important, it is important to note that Japan support was mostly based on economic tools. And economic tools, I, I want to, to pay attention in this moment because it was important um, tools to Japan since the late of 90s to Japan participate in international uh, relations. And we can see this in the fourth phase. <clears throat> Since 1999 to 2005, this is a period after the code, uh, the end of the Cold War. And in this fourth period, is marked by the reductions of bilateral tensions between US and Soviet Union. And there were expectations that decline of the number of, of the wars. In this context, Japan was pointed out that uh, Japan was pointed out as potential new order leader and uh, exemplary pacifist, pacifist country. That's an important point because Japan has some restrictions by its constitution, and Japan was saw as a pacific or pacifist country. This character is is very interesting because Japan was the light to be ascribed to ascribe the role of the civilian power after the Cold War. And the international community expected that Japan should play a significant role in the post-Cold War in the international relations. But uh, what kind of uh, role Japan could develop? And here, in this chart, we have another professor, Saito Shiro. In his book from 99, he mentioned two kinds of leadership that Japan could play. A leadership example and the leadership initiative. And I think it's interesting to, to pay a little attention in this two types of leadership, because these two types of leadership was changing during the time, during the late years. In fact, we, there were many discussions about what kind of international role Japan could play since the end of the Cold War. And in my opinion, the first style, the leadership example, was the style developed by Japan during the second half of 20th century, especially after the Cold War. And this type is near of the civilian power mentioned by Inogut and Bacon. And this uh, uh, a type of uh, a foreign policy. And the second type, leadership initiative, is the uh, profile that Japan trying to develop in the recent years. In this case, the country must be more active in its style and can be what we are seeing in the lately uh, two decades in the Japanese foreign policy. And two important events influence these profiles. The first, as you can see here, 
was the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And the second event was the 2001, the World Trade Center attacks. And these two events, I think, influenced very much the Japanese foreign policy. And in which way? <clears throat> the first one, okay, here. After fall of the Berlin Wall, the discussion of the New World Order were about the change of the paradigms. The military power was seen as less important in the international relations and the economic power gained more importance. And for this reason, Japan as the second economy in the world was saw as an important country in this new world order because Japan had, uh, was the second economy and had the image of high technological uh, country and it could replace US as uh, international leader. But uh, in the same time, Japanese government representatives declared more than once that Japan was the time to change their foreign policy. And more than this, the Japanese government representatives declared that since the 1990, uh, that period was the turning point of Japanese foreign policy. And you can see some examples of these uh, declarations. For example, here uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan in Blue Book, we take some uh, words like here. For example, the first one, it has to be point, pointed out that Japan today is in a position to influence virtually all issues related to the construction of the new international order. In the second, one of the responsibilities of Japan, which has become capable of influencing the construction of international order. And finally, expand actively diplomatic efforts in political affairs to help erase the peace and security of the world. As you can see here, Japanese government shows some um, efforts to participate more in the international relations, but there's a, a little problem because Japan has a constitution that have some, uh, has some uh, restrictions to Japan. Then how uh, many Japanese government representatives declared that Japan was the time to change their foreign, its foreign policy and to participate more in the international issues. But in fact, because of international, because of his, its uh, constitutional limitations in the Article 9, the Japan renounced the use of military force as means of settling international disputes. And because of this, Tokyo imposed self restrictions to increase Japan's international role. In this way, we can see the three pillars mentioned by Prime Minister Takeshita in 1989. And he mentioned here, cooperation for peace, strain international cultural exchange, and erasement of official development assistance ODA. And in fact, if we, we see some numbers in this chart, in this period from 99 until 2005, the period that uh, Professor Inoguchi called global civilian power, the Japan made a lot of efforts to contribute to international issues or international relations through 
ODA. And in this period, Japan was in the first or second position in the largest countries to contribute, contribute in ODA. It's a, um, basically one example of a leadership example mentioned by uh, Inoguchi and Bacon. The problem was that this too was based in the Japanese economic power. And what happened after with Japanese economy? Here. In 1991, the Japanese had a very big problem because of the Japanese economic bubble burst. And because of this fact, Japan had problems to continue its uh, foreign policy based in the economic power. And this fact have had a uh, a very huge impact in the Japanese uh, government disposition to continue the same policy based in economic contribution. And at the same time, they perceived that uh, this kind of leadership could not be uh, developed at this time. And the leadership example is start to be in the past. Then government start to change their, uh, their <clears throat> position in the foreign policy. Especially after this moment in 2010, China replaced Japan as the second largest economy in the world. Then if in the past or, or until 2010, Japan used this position and economic power to international relations contribution. After this time, because China started to be uh, more uh, bigger than, than Japan in economic terms, uh, the Japanese contribution for, for example, uh, multilateral, multilateral organization and Japanese ODA uh, start to <clears throat> lose some status and the foreign policy start to be uh, weaker than in the past. And because of this, we can see some discussions about how Japan could participate more in the international relations. Okay. And here again, we turn to the uh, Saito Shiro arguments. If we saw some leadership example until the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, and Japan, uh, Japanese government tried to be a civilian power, because of this weakness in the Japanese economy, the Japanese foreign policy are to, to change to a leadership initiative. And what it means? <clears throat> we can see that Japan and Japanese government uh, start to, to become more active in the international relations. And we have some examples of this change. Here. One fact, one event that I mentioned that <clears throat> influenced Japanese foreign policy was the World Trade Center attacks in 2001. This event uh, made po uh, possible to Japan and Japanese government to change their uh, profile. In which way? We can see if in the past Japan pay more attention in their uh, economic contribution for international relations issues. From 2001, Japan started to uh, participate more with their self-defense force 
and pay more attention uh, to strengthen the Japanese uh, self-defense force and change the status of uh, self-defense force also with uh, Abe uh, government, prime minister. And here we can see three examples, three episodes of this changing that have been uh, occurring in the Japanese foreign policy. For example, in 2001, I read in 2001, the Japanese Self-Defense Force or Japanese Coast Guard uh, exchanged fire, gunfire with this vessel. Uh, and this vessel sunk. The interesting point is that even Japanese self-defense force was forced in this moment, uh, the public or Japanese public opinion support the actions. This is an important issue because until that time, most of the Japanese population was against uh, this kind of actions, the Japanese uh, military participation, international issues, and one example was in the uh, Iraq war in 1991, when Japanese government had problems to send troops to that area. But here we have some change in the Japanese government policy, self-defense force and Japanese public opinion. Again, in 2001, we have uh, Afghanistan uh, actions of the American uh, military power force. And that time, uh, Japan again sent uh, show efforts to support Jap uh, American uh, action in the uh, Afghanistan uh, country, sent uh, support for American troops, for example, uh, refueling. Uh, ships in, in the uh, in the ocean. Other actions, this self uh, self defense force was used also to block terrorists and arms and drugs in the Afghanistan. There's a, a different uh, profile of Japanese foreign policy that shows some changing from the past. Uh, other change that we can see here is that the Japanese troops in this time was equipped with and tank weapons. That's very important because in the other occasion that I mentioned in 1991, the self-defense force could not use this kind of weapons. And more than this, uh, in this time, the self-defense force uh, troops could, could also protect themselves, use uh, this kind of weapons to protect themselves, individuals or facilities in their charge. So then this is a different uh, type of participation that J Japan self-defense force had in this moment. Then what we can say, we can see that uh, Japan has been changing their profile, foreign policy profile during this time, uh, especially from uh, Koizumi prime minister. And the argument for this change was the uh, terrorism combat. But other things that also realized that the Japanese contribution in 1991 uh, was not enough to change the uh, international community perceptions about the Japanese contribution for international relations issues. Because in 1991, the Japanese government sent money as a kind of participation. It's not a, a little money, but a lot of money. For example, in uh, 1991, 
the Japanese contribution for the war is like uh, 13 uh, billion of dollars. I think is the, the, the biggest value of the contribution among the, the accounts that participated in the, that war. But um, even with this large amount of money, the international uh, community, the other countries, did not recognize, recognize the contribution of Japan. And in fact, other countries criticized this kind of contribution because they expected that Japan could participate with troops sending uh, people to the war, not only money. Then uh, Quism perceived, realized this kind of uh, situation and start to change the law or the interpretation of Constitution of Japan to increase the Japanese participation in the international issues. And here in this chart again, we can see uh, another change. Japan start to uh, ask for more participation also in the uh, Security Council. As you can see in this chart, Japan had in 2000 uh, a huge contribution for uh, United Nations budget. The United States had 25%, Japan 20%, the second one, the third was Germany and France. And that time, because of this kind of participation, they, Japan with Brazil, India, and Germany uh, established the G4. Yeah? And I use this acronym, Big G, yeah? because Japan was the, the biggest one. Yeah? from uh, among these, these four countries. And Brazil, India, Germany, and Japan. And Japan had really big uh, contribution to uh, United Nations budget. Then you can see this kind of uh, Japanese uh, efforts to participate more, not only in issues, but also in the international organizations like uh, Security Council. But again, here the money is one important thing because Japan had important contribution and this could base the Japanese demand for more participation in the uh, Security Council. But again, the Japanese economic situation will start to be weak compared with China then this kind of uh, demand uh, starts to be difficult to, to continue because the participation of Japan in the uh, United Nations budget started to decrease. And if you compare on other years, you can see it was 20%, but here in this period, decreased to almost 10%, here 85 percent And if we see today, 2020, the contribution of Japan to United Nations budget is like 8.6%. Uh, 8, 8 and China now, nowadays, has um, more participation than Japan. And then the fix is changing. And because of this, the Japanese foreign policy profile has to change also. <clears throat> and because of this kind of uh, transformations in the international relations and the international scenario, we can see that uh, Prime Minister Abe also made some change in the uh, Japanese foreign policy and even inside of Japan. For example, in 2006, uh, Prime Minister Abe changed the name of uh, defense agents 
to Ministry, ministry of Defense. Uh, maybe for us here in Brazil, this kind of change, the name change, uh, made no uh, big difference for us, but has it has in fact uh, a symbolic and a major uh, uh, difference, not only inside in Japan, but uh, to other countries also. Uh, again, Prime Minister Abe also in 2000 uh, made other kind of uh, changes. For example, 2012, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, <clears throat> made more efforts to increase the participation uh, of Japan in the US, uh, with uh, US, in the US alliance. And 2013, under the Shinzo Abe Prime Minister, they established, established National Security Council. This was important uh, change also in the bureaucratic system in Japan, because with this change, the Prime Minister of Japan starts to have to have uh, a forum to discuss this kind of issues inside of the government and with uh, more influence of the prime minister. Then again, we have more uh, change in the Japanese uh, situation. And here in 2016, again under the Abe, Prime Minister, we have a new foreign policy that Professor Ikshita mentioned the, in the last uh, meeting, the free and open in the Pacific. And here in Brazil, many times we have discussed about uh, One Belt and One Road initiative, but sometimes we can see that this kind of, uh, this project um, has some uh, problems also with money, with the budget, um, stopped in, in some parts and some countries have had some uh, uh, resistance to participate in this project of China. But here uh, in the Japanese project, free and open the Pacific, we can see that Japan not only have uh, a plan, but in fact, it's implementation of this plan already. And many kind of cooperation with uh, Southeast countries already being uh, implemented. That's very important. And here I want to show a, a short video about this uh, initiative. Let's try to, let's see if it works. For Asian country in general, we have limited connectivity due to the capacity of the airport. This has created a barrier in the oh, oh. mobility of trade and also the human resource development in the region. We have been receiving a lot of support from Japanese government, not just from the funding, but the whole project. Is a complete support from the design to the building and training. We have significantly improved technology equipment systems such as a fuel hydrant system and the new baggage handling system. And also we have a central command center. From next year, we will carry out a second phase of Terminal 2, which will extend the capacity to 15 million passengers per year. Chính phủ Nhật Bản đã giúp Hải quan Việt Nam triển khai áp dụng cái hệ thống thông quan tự động có tên là Vinac Vesis. Thì sau khi đưa hệ thống này hoạt động thì hệ thống cũng đã giúp chúng tôi giúp Hải quan Việt Nam rất nhiều trong việc cải thiện cái hoạt động thông quan hàng hóa. Connectivity is very important for the ASEAN region because it helps to narrow the development gap within the 10 ASEAN member states and even in a global context. Programs such as JSPP21, which is in its 21st year, provides an additional value for the region to get together and benefit from the experiences of Japan. 
This is a great opportunity for learning from other control. We have to learn from gathering around and talk to each other. I would like to thank Japan Singapore Partnership Program for giving us an opportunity to learn from other countries. Okay, <clears throat> then you can see things that start to happen in the Japanese foreign policy and change that Japanese government start to, to make in Japan. And and now, if in the past we saw the leadership example, now we saw, we see uh, a leadership initiative. And other fact that happened in Japan is this uh, policy. It started with uh, Abe, Prime Minister, the pacifist practice. Again, now Japan foreign policy is not only example of uh, foreign policy or example of country, but start to uh, develop a leadership uh, among Asian countries and start to uh, develop also leadership among countries, for example, in the FWIP between Japan, Australia, India, and United States. There's a, a difference that we have here at this moment if we compare in the past. In 2014, Another change that we have in Japan, the cabinet Abe approved the self, uh, collective self-defense. Uh, with this uh, change, now Japan can uh, send troops to participate with collective uh, efforts in the military efforts outside of Japan. And finally, <clears throat> uh, with this uh, slide, I want to and my reflections about what have been uh, occurring with Japan foreign policy and why Japan uh, started to pursue, pursue the power. The, I think the first uh, point is the rise of China as a great power and the investment of China has been done in the uh, defense area. And as May Shire, May Shire said, uh, when we think about the uh, international relations or countries' relations, we can see that international relations or international system is an arc, or we can say that um, we have problems, the country are, uh, the country are egoist, and they want to uh, have more beneficial from other countries. And we don't know what we uh, can expect from China with uh, this power, power that China uh, start to have. The great powers possess some offensive military capability. In this case of China, China has been investing in more uh, military power and this made um, suspicions and uh, Make uh, problem made problems with uh, neighborhoods. The states can never be certain about other states' intentions. Then it means that even China government saying that uh, this economic growth is for uh, population beneficial or something like that, we're not sure about what China can do with more power in their hands, especially Xi Jinping. And finally, survival is the primary goal of the great powers. In the case of Japan, if you compare all of these themes, uh, Japan, China, Brazil, survive is the primary goal of the great powers. Then if they face some uh, threats, it's important 
or one government trying to um, promote some uh, efforts to their defense, their status in international area, uh, and something like that. And all the great powers are regional actors. Then Japan, United States, China, India. We can see that each country, each country, has been done some uh, actions in the foreign policy, in the cooperation of other countries, to provide more, more uh, power and more tools to defend themselves. Then that's why I think the Japanese foreign policy has been changing since uh, the lately years of the 20th century and this first two decades of 21st century shows that Japan have been uh, putting more efforts in the uh, leadership initiative, not only a leadership example. Well, thank you very much. This is my, my exposition. Thank you so much, Professor Wahada. This was a great presentation. I would like to remind our audience to send their questions through the link available in the description of this lecture. And without further ado, I introduce our commentator who will enrich this discussion directly from a Friday morning in Japan, Dr. Narushigi Michishita, Vice President and Professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, in Tokyo, and specialist in Japanese security and foreign policy, as well as security studies on the Korean Peninsula. He acquired his PhD with distinction from the School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University. His professional background includes the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and multiple positions in the government of Japan, such as the National Security Secretariat Advisory Board, Japan's National Institute for Defense Studies at the Ministry of Defense and the Cabinet Secretariat for Security and Crisis Management. Professor Michishita, good morning to you in Japan and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wehara, for the presentation. And thank you very much, Luana, for the kind introduction. Um, I have two uh, comments and one question. So uh, first comment is that um, uh, Japan's leadership. Uh, Professor Uehara talked about how Japanese leadership kind of uh, uh, went, uh, uh, came up, down, up and down and things that over time. Um, interesting, interesting thing happened uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, two things happened. One, uh, the United States became much more isol well, much less internationalist and somewhat isolation, somewhat more isolationist. Uh, Obama, President Obama, you know, people think uh, President Obama was very different from President Trump, but uh, in terms of uh, foreign policy orientation, he has a lot in common with uh, President Trump uh, because he, uh, when he was uh, president, uh, President Obama famously said uh, the United States was no longer a world policeman, right? So he was basically declaring that the U.S. will not be able to, would not uh, take care of all the difficulties out in the world and uh, the U.S. will uh, more will be more focused on its own affairs, right? So it's uh, you know basically talking about the U.S. becoming a little more isolationist. And uh, President Trump, when he came into office, took this uh, to a like uh, to the extreme, right? So he was trying to pull out U.S. forces from different parts of the world, uh, reduce uh, U.S. commitment, and uh, trying to force or I encourage uh, other countries to share more burden. So that was uh, Trump and you know, Obama and Trump. And interestingly, uh, um, in Japan, uh, Prime Minister Abe, well, Mr. Abe became uh, Prime Minister in uh, 2012, uh, 2012. And he started to talk about, uh, you know, uh, proactive, uh, in, 
foreign policy, right? As uh, Professor Uehara talked about. So it was an interesting period in which uh, the roles of Japan and the US in international affairs re got reversed, right? So the US had you know, uh, long been internationalist, very engaging, whereas Japan remained uh, very much isolationist. But during that interesting period, Japan uh, was like, you know, um, there was a, a lot, much larger room for Japan to take leadership in international relations, and it did uh, under uh, leadership of uh, Mr. Abe. So surprise, surprise. Uh, what's interesting going forward is that what will happen to that relationship, because uh, apparently uh, President Biden is much more internationalist uh, than President Trump or even Tr President uh, Obama. Uh, although there is a limit uh, to what the U.S. might be able to do. I mean, given, uh, as we have seen in what happened in Afghanistan, the U.S. is not interested in, you know, like uh, uh, um, remains remaining to be deeply uh, involved everywhere in the world. Uh, then uh, leadership change, there was a leadership change in Japan, right? So now we have... Uh, um, Prime Minister Kishida, who is interested in international politics. I mean, he served as a uh, foreign minister for a long time, but uh, may, he might not be too as interested in security and foreign policy issues as uh, Mr. Abe. So we'll see what will happen. That's one first comment. And the rated to the first comment is, uh, uh, you know, it was a, there was an interesting description uh, talking about pacifism proactive in one of the slides uh, that uh, Professor Wehala showed us, which was interesting. This, this is a really a good uh, translation. Um, I've been wondering how to translate this uh, pr pacifism proactive, because when, when I, if I say proactive pacifism, that might sound, might so might sound too, um, too aggressive <laughs> because I mean it might uh, you know sounds like uh, you would go out and uh, punish people who don't uh, you know uh, uphold this pacifism right uh, you know uh, but anyway so that's a good uh, translation and uh, interesting thing is why did Japan start to use this phrase you know pacifism proactive because Japan had long been isolationist, right? Um, Japan was calling, and today it does, uh, even today to some extent, but Japan was, and the Japanese people were saying that Japan was a was pacifist, right? It's a pacifist nation, right? But it was, a, to me, was a more a cover uh, of re reality than reality <laughs> because you know when the japanese people talked about pacifism what it really meant was that let's stay away from messy dirty international wars and conflicts right that was the thing and uh, we didn't want to get involved in foreign wars and you know difficult situations in uh, the, the politician, Japanese politicians, as well as Japanese people hesitated uh, to send our troops to different places because we didn't want to put our service men and women in harm's way, right? And, uh, but, you know, uh, it, it might have, I mean, it would have sounded bad if we say, oh, we don't want to, you know, put our forces in harm's way, we, so we stay away. So we might would have sounded uh, irresponsible. So rather than saying we do, don't want to do, do this, uh, we said, oh, because we are pacifist, uh, we, are, we uh, oppose wars, we don't get involved those, in those wars. Um, that's changing. <laughs> uh, Japan, uh, especially under Mr. Abe's leadership, uh, started to move slowly away from isolationism toward internationalism. So there is a still a limit, uh, but uh, Japan has now become much more engaging and engaged in international affairs and much more proactive in taking leadership. Um, and why is Japan doing so? I would say there are at least uh, two reasons. One, um, 
you know, rise of China, balance of power, the balance of power has, is shifting in this region. And unless Japan does more, uh, it will be difficult for us to um, maintain the balance of power in this region. And second, uh, probably more importantly, uh, there is a growing concern in Japan and in this region that the US might really become much more isolationist, right? So, you know, it was a, uh, now the President Biden is there, so we are relieved, but it was a close call, right? Um, presidential election, you know, uh, President Biden won, but uh, with a very small, slim margin. Uh, so that can change quickly. So uh, by making us uh, more committed and uh, taking leadership and making it more uh, uh, lucrative for the U.S. to remain as a Pacific power, we are trying to uh, kind of anchor uh, the United States to this region. And finally, uh, one question uh, to Professor Wehara. So what is the role of uh, Brazil in this? Um, what is the relationship of uh, Bra Brazil with um, you know, the countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, including Japan? Uh, if any, what is uh, Brazilian, Brazil's strategy toward uh, free and Indo-Pacific uh, like concept and approaches? And uh, so what, what kind of uh, relationship, what, what kind of partnership are we, uh, is Brazil trying to establish with Japan? And what are the opportunities and challenges uh, going forward for uh, Brazil and Japan to cooperate together? So that's my question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Lekshita for your comments, brilliant comments and for a question. In fact, this question is a question that I do myself. What kind of project we Brazil has at this moment? Uh, what I can say is that uh, Brazil had uh, foreign policy and very stable foreign policy since the past, trying to be, uh, 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 how can I say, in the middle way in, in principles foreign policy. But uh, in the later years, uh, I'm not sure about what kind of product the government has. But in my opinion, it's different from government in my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Asia countries is the, uh, are the very important countries at this moment in the near future because the economic growth happened in Asia. And if Brazil wants to be a, 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 a big player or be important in the following years, Japan, uh, Brazil have to has to uh, start to pay attention what happened in Asia with Japan or in other countries. Even Indonesia, for example, uh, the the data of the uh, last year 2020, uh, the Asian for uh, trade with Brazil was bigger than with Mercosul. Then now Asian country is more important than Mercosul, for example. Then I think it's very important for Brazil government to pay more attention and to, to plan a uh, 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 more, uh, how can I say, broad, uh, foreign policy related to Asia and have to see what kind of Brazil interest Brazil has in Asia, not an ideological uh, position, but concrete interest, economic interest, political interest uh, with Japan, with China, with other countries, Korea. And for example, uh, one important thing that Brazil lost a lot of time was with part economic partnership. For example, Japan is very important country, was very important uh, trade partner with, for Brazil, but in the uh, later years, uh, this relation started to decrease. Then what happened here? Yeah, we have to pay more attention about this kind of relation with Japan. Then I think uh, Brazil losing time at this moment. We have to pay more attention about what has happened in Asia 
and especially with Japan, because Japan is a very important country for us. That's my position. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to both professors for this enlightening exchange. As we have little time left, I would take only one, but a complex question from the audience, which asks, um, considering the order trans transition currently taking place in the international system, what do you believe could be the role of the free and open in the Pacific for a strategy? I will add the question to our chat so you can see it more clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, again, Asia is a, a very important region at this moment. And we have there uh, important countries that has interest there. For example, Japan, China, India, and for example, China, India, and Japan is a, are very big uh, economic countries. And China and India has uh, nuclear power. But Japan on the other side has uh, relation mutual uh, agreement with United States, then uh, that's a very sensitive uh, region at this moment. And FOIP uh, uh, is an important agreement because uh, as I, I show in, the, in my presentation, we're not sure about what kind of plans China has at this moment. And uh, if we want a more stable uh, relations, as Professor Mikshita mentioned, we have to to plan this kind of balance of power. Yeah, because at this moment China do many things that is against the uh, international law, for example, or in the uh, Sea uh, Asian Sea. Sorry, uh, China Sea with the islands or artificial islands uh, is a, a very controversial uh, action of China in the region against interests of uh, many countries there. And if we don't, if we don't have uh, this kind of uh, uh, balance of power, uh, it's very difficult to see uh, the uh, border or the frontier of China uh, actions in the future. That, that's why I think WIPE is very important at this moment, not only for Asian countries, but even for Brazil. We are far from that area, but it's important to see what China will do in the foreign policy around the world. That's my point of view. Thank you, Professor. Um, as we approach the end of this event, we would like to thank once again both professors, our audience, and also the Japan House São Paulo for supporting the event. Next lectures will take place on December 1st and 8th, touching on political economic issues involving the, the Asia Pacific. So thank you so much and have a great night. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mikshita. Thank you, Luana. Thank you very much, Professor Uehara. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye. Bye from Tokyo. <laughs> Keep in touch and see you again.